Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight for another Minnesota Hockey Player Development Webinar. My name is Jacob Mars. I chair the Hockey Director Committee for Minnesota Hockey. And our topic tonight, in-game coaching, um, in-game coaching roles and communication with Wes Bolin uh, is, a, is really going to be a good topic because we focus a lot of time and energy on skill development, player development practices, but now we'll be able to talk about how do you coach during a game and how do you utilize your coaches during a game, which is an important topic for all of us to learn. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the hockey director committee, every district has a hockey director and hopefully your associations do as well. And our role is to assist your association in implementing the American development model and the Minnesota development model and proper development structures and coaching education and player education and helping you facilitate the best player development program for your athletes. During this presentation, if you have questions, please send them through the Zoom chat feature directly to me, and I will facilitate that with Wes. So Wes, thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, great to be here, Jacob. Thanks for having me. Welcome to as everybody I'm, who's here. As I'm sure most of you can see on the screen, Wes is the ADM coordinator for Minnesota Hockey and the head boys coach at Woodbury High School. Uh, Wes spends a lot of time traveling the state and putting on skills clinics and training our coaches and players on those uh, on the proper skill development techniques. So we're excited to have you, Wes, uh, and thanks for your time. Thanks for uh, having me. Look forward to uh, getting going. How's that? Are we on? Awesome, I hope so. All right, uh, that's me. Let's see if I can get my uh, PowerPoint going here. So you've got some things to follow along uh, as we go. Here are some of the topics that we're gonna talk about here tonight. Uh, coaching roles, pregame routine, communicating with players, uh, line changes, some in-game strategies, uh, uh, and then uh, some body language, communicating with referees, post-game routine. Just kind of go with, uh, with that kind of, uh, uh, a philosophy. I went with the idea that uh, like what happens uh, uh, on a game day, that's kind of where a coach is put on test and uh, all of the things that uh, they've been working on gets a chance to be shown. So uh, let's, uh, let's get her going here. All right, if I can just get my pointer going here. Boom. First thing to understand is uh, what's your philosophy regarding your coaching balance? Uh, I think this is a really important thing for you to understand is uh, where do you stand on the relationship between education and competitiveness, teaching and winning. If I can imagine this as a uh, line right here, I don't know if my, uh, there we go, got my mouse going here. This is a line hey, right here. Hey, you hey, have done. Yeah. Hey, Wes, we cannot see your screen. You cannot see my screen. Well, let's go back and, uh, and figure that part out. Okay. You think I was with my, uh, my students. Every time I do something with my students on this distant learning, I always got to go back and do something else. I thought I had shared the screen and then I went there and then I share. So you there should there see my day. You guys should see my day. Uh, every time I think I've got uh, the lesson all set, uh, I don't. And uh, I got to go back in and uh, flip something around. And it's usually about 1030 when the first student uh, discovers that because they, uh, they ain't up early enough to get things figured out. But uh, here's where we're going. Now you can see that. Am I good? Awesome. Okay. So understand that I'm a history teacher. We talk a lot about uh, political spectrum and a balance in things, whether it's conservative, liberal, things like that. So let's understand our balance as a coach. Our balance as a coach is somewhere between winning all the time and teaching, competitiveness and education. As a high school coach, I got to do a lot of educating, but as a varsity coach, a lot of people want me to be really competitive. And so you got to figure out where that balance is for you at that coach, as a coach. And it's going to change in a lot of different situations. Okay. You also are balancing the concept of fun and work. And uh, throughout my uh, teaching and coaching career, I've, I've really tried to emphasize are kids having fun and do they know how to work hard? And, and is hard work fun? And once you kind of create that and get that uh, message through, 
then you've kind of got the balance of, a, of an educator coach. And that's what, uh, that's what we're aiming to do as uh, amateur coaches here. Now, there's also some other things that go along with that. We have to understand that balance changes with each level. If this is the different levels of hockey that we might be able to coach at, we start over here and we're probably emphasizing teaching and fun, but as we move up, there's more of an emphasis on winning and work. And when you get to the highest levels, that's what it is. And hopefully that sense of hockey as a fun sport has been ingrained all the way. Otherwise your job ain't very much fun. And uh, so that's, that's something for us to take a look at. Now we also have to understand the notion of freedom versus discipline, creativity versus structure. And an individual, what does that individual player want? And what's the best for the team? And this is a really important aspect for us as we start uh, getting above that might level. Where do we balance individual freedom with team discipline? Where do we have that sense of what's good for the individual kid and what's good for the team as a whole? And uh, these are all concepts that are over here. If you go entirely by these concepts over here, you're gonna have some challenges. If you go over here and you go entirely by these uh, concepts over here, you're also gonna have some challenges. You need to find what's the right balance for me as a coach at this particular moment. And so every day, every game, we have to go into that game understanding where we are. Now, this is what it might look like. If you're a mite, you're way over here in the fun level. And as these mites go from those first year mini mites, they're gonna slide a little bit here to the right. And now they start understanding some team concepts and some discipline concepts. With the squirts, we're still way over here in the fun level, but we're gonna pull them a little bit further to the right. And then as we get to a peewee level, we're still over here hoping that the game, but by this time they've got four or five years into them, uh, maybe six or seven, who knows? And now all of a sudden the game is, is inherently fun for them, but we've got to pull them even further and understand that individual, it's not just about individual, it's about team. And that gets even further, especially when they get to this age where uh, we have to have team discipline. As a high school coach, uh, we get up here, we still have to respect individuals and do things that are going to help benefit uh, individual kids, but yet our goal is to be a really good team. Now, there's some years where they're more competitive than others. I see my friend Ricky Sainty over here from uh, Rosemount. They had an unbelievable competitive run the last couple of years. They're way over here. My Woodbury team hasn't been quite as competitive, so we're over here making sure we emphasize a ton of fun while still trying to attain that competitive level. When you get to the junior level and above, these arrows are going to go further to the right, further to the right, further to the right. It's all about work. So understand that as we, uh, as we go along. Now, your role as a head coach, you're responsible for everything that happens, okay? If it's good, your job is to give somebody else credit, have some humility about it. It's not, it's not you who, uh, who created all of the uh, success for your team. You might have had a huge part in it, but you might also have great uh, talented players. You might have great assistant coaches. Uh, um, but if it's bad, you have to take responsibility for it. And that's what real leadership's about. And so everything that's going on in the game day, you have to be in charge of it. You have to understand what am I going to do uh, in situations? Do I have all of these situations prepared? And so understand uh, that as we begin to put together uh, other things. The other thing to understand before we even get started is uh, most youth coaches are going to coach their own child. Okay, I'm uh, at that point in my career where uh, I'm starting to coach my grandchild and uh, he's down at the mini mice, both of them, and uh, it's a ton of fun. Okay, not a ton of work, not a ton of discipline. Okay, I've got to figure out, and I've been a parent coaching along all the time, to what extent should you coach your own child? And are you doing it for yourself or for your child or for both of you? And if it's inherently for both of you, then it's probably really healthy. But if it's just for you, because you want to hang out with your kid and your kid ain't excited to have you around, then it's probably not a great, uh, a great uh, situation. And then where is your balance between being hard and soft on your child? This is really tough. Okay, this is really tough. 
if you're too soft on your child, you give advantages and you lose a sense of team because everybody knows that you're playing favorites to your kids. Now, what oftentimes happens is you're too, someone's too hard on their kid. And that happens by a lot of times people who are really, sometimes maybe they're really experienced hockey guys uh, or gals who've, been, who've got some, some uh, uh, high expectations. They become very demanding and then they lose their child. And so it's really tough to maintain that balance. And it's also important to understand that usually uh, when you're going to be on a team and be a head coach, uh, let somebody else coach your own kid. And uh, I think one of the, you know, that's just really important. I can remember that from uh, having my, my oldest daughter in uh, youth soccer. And I, I figured out the age in which, uh, which I, I wouldn't coach her anymore. And that was, uh, you know, that was going into ninth grade. Like I'd come home from practice every day and I'd be mad as heck. And uh, all the rest of the girls on her team, they, they had a great time, but I was mad as heck at my daughter. My other daughter in softball, I kept telling her for two years, she needed a new softball glove. And uh, finally, she's playing freshman softball and I'm co-coaching the team with the young guy. And I says, hey, will you tell her to get a new glove? I've been trying to get her a new glove, get her a new glove for the last couple of years. So after practice, my daughter comes up to me. Hey, dad, you think uh, you think you could buy me a new glove? My coach says it's too small for me. Sure, Lance, no problem. So you have to understand that the kids don't uh, Kids, kids don't want to necessarily be coached by you. They just want to be loved by you. And so that's a really tough balance for you to figure out as well. So figure that point out. Now, as we put things together for your team, keep that concept in mind. Okay, keep that concept in mind. What are the roles you're going to have for your staff? Uh, do you have balance in their roles? What, are the, what roles are your assistant coaches going to have? Now, if I look at this list right here, this is like all the things that you, and it may not even be all the things you are probably looking at and saying, oh, Wes, you forgot that, you forgot that. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, that's probably the case, but you, these are all the things that you kind of have to be responsible for at some point. Obviously you've got to deal with the forwards. You've got to deal with the defenseman. Um, and are you going to have, uh, how are you going to line change? Who's going to change? Uh, who's going to get the door? Who's going to, uh, who's going to uh, decide if we're going to have different positions. Do you think about the concept of an offensive and defensive coordinator? Has, has you allowed one assistant coach to say, you know what, I'll take the penalty kill and uh, some defensive zone things for us. Okay. And another coach says, yep, I'll take the power play and some uh, offensive zone things for us or work on an offensive thing. Or are you taking control of everything? Those are the kinds of concepts that you have to have figured out ahead of time. You have to be able to communicate those with your coaches and create a, a balance structure within that. Your goal is, does he have, uh, do they have a specific uh, coach for it? Maybe you don't have that luxury. Uh, I know a lot of times here in Minnesota, we're, we're really working towards uh, giving a, a specific identified uh, coach to, to help, uh, uh, help with our goaltenders. Sometimes it's the father of the goalie. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes uh, uh, that can have some challenges. And then you have to figure out ahead of time, who's going to take care of player injuries? Because there's going to be them. Who's going to, who's going to go and get them? I'm not going to go get them. I got a man in the door for the defense. Well, somebody's got to go get them. Someone's got to take care of that kid on the ice. He's got equipment issues. As younger ages, those are more critical. Uh, who's going to get the stuff? And what are we going to do in between periods? And what's our pregame, postgame look like? So we've got to identify all of those things ahead of time. And obviously, I can't tell you exactly what, what to do in each of those situations. I just know that those are things that you have to consider as you're going into uh, that game day. Now, when you get to the rink, you've hopefully established a pregame routine. Um, I get to the rink, um, my wife used to say, like on a game day on Saturday, okay, it's Saturday, huh? six o'clock in the morning, what time's the game? Well, if it's at one o'clock, I probably better get going. And uh, I'm there usually six hours before the game, at least when I was a younger coach, because I'm like, nobody can get there ahead of me. And even now, nobody gets to the rink before me, unless it's now my JV coach, which I'm satisfied with that. But uh, I, you got to get to the rink ahead of time. You don't walk in right when uh, the players are supposed to be there. You're always there ahead of time. Then you should also connect with your opponent. That's a huge part of... Uh, uh, of uh, your respect for the game is uh, welcoming your opponent if you're on the road 
uh, excuse me, if you're at home, and then uh, seeking out the uh, uh, opposing coach if you are on the road. Uh, that's just part of being professional. Uh, also, uh, who's going to take care of the off-ice dynamic warm-up? You see those more and more at younger and younger ages. Kids are getting under understanding that that's a part of that. Uh, which assistant coach are you going to put in charge of that? Or do you think you have to have hands on for that? Uh, I'm, I'm big into letting one of my assistant coaches do that. That would be a great, uh, a great uh, one for them, especially if they're the kind of coach who's maybe, uh, um, you know, really eager to help out to be a, a assist, but not necessarily a, a great uh, hockey background, but they're a good athletic background. Uh, that'd be a great, uh, great thing for them. They're just, you know, eager and excited to help. Then we got to figure out what's our pregame uh, routine uh, uh, regarding uh, the speeches. Everybody's got to give a speech, it seems. And uh, we got to figure out what's your emphasis going to be. Uh, how many points do you think you need to make? If you're going over three, you're way too much. Okay. And is there a balance in your talks? Okay. Between creativity and structure. Are you, are you in the locker room designing face-off plays? Are you in the locker room uh, going over the four-check system that you just went over the day before and the defensive zone system that you just went over the day before? Is there a balance between creativity and structure, fun and work? And do all coaches really need to address the team as a whole? Because I know I've, I've listened inside of uh, some squirt locker rooms and uh, um, I'm telling you, I thought that they were getting ready for, I thought they were getting ready to, for, you know, for playing a section championship to go to the state tournament. And, uh, uh, you know, they're going on eight, nine, 10 minutes listening there. And some of them are down on one knee in front and they're like, God, how could you even skate after that? And, uh, uh, you know, three or four coaches are all addressing the team. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen some other youth coaches do great jobs with small groups of players. Okay, a group talking about defensemen, a group talking with the forwards, okay, a group talking with, uh, uh, with units of five. And uh, all of those things are really good. Short, short, short is better. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. And really, I don't think everybody needs to, to say a word. Uh, with my team, uh, with my team, uh, our pregame routine is uh, we meet at the end of the second period of the JV game. Uh, and... Uh, uh, um, my assistant coach will go over anything tactical and I'll go over anything philosophical for the uh, team. They go for their uh, uh, pregame stretch and then we come back and uh, right before we go out on the ice, uh, there's really nothing more that gets said. Uh, you know, the guys are all kind of getting themselves ready. Obviously, there needs to be more structure with that as, uh, as they're younger. Now, communicating with players on the bench. Um, you have to understand uh, that kids are, are, are sensitive. They'll hear everything that you say. They'll also know if you don't say anything to them. And you've got to think about, uh, uh, do you need to speak, first of all? And is it a compliment or is it a correction? Kids don't always like to be corrected, especially by dad. They love to be complimented. And if you can compliment them with your eyes, with your smile, with your words, those are great things. They don't need to be corrected after every shift. They don't need to be told once every, every shift they come off, hey, here's what you did wrong that shift. Here's what you did wrong that shift. Okay, you know, pick your points, pick your time. When do you wanna say something? And uh, I think it's really important to understand this line here. Is it for the player or for you to feel you are coaching? Especially for coaches that just get started. Cause I can remember when I was a young coach getting started, I'm like, geez, I better say something. I better say something or I'm not really coaching. And so we think we got to say something all the time. So the people think that we're coaching when a lot of times the best coaching is saying nothing. And uh, so I think that's an uh, important concept for you to think about. Now your tone, your facial expression is as important as words. Okay. You can smile. And especially if you're going to correct someone you say that was a great shift that time, but I really wish you would have you know, not hit that kid over the head with two, with two hands with your stick because the referee might've caught that one. And now you'd have been in the penalty box. So maybe next time let's try to keep our stick on the ice. Okay. That would be great. So if you can correct them with a smile uh, and a positive tone, I think that's going to be, uh, be a little, a little helpful for you as well. And I think your communication has to understand, does it meet the appropriate balance point that you're trying to achieve between competitiveness and teaching, competitiveness and teaching, winning and 
uh, and, and fun and, and that uh, sense that we're trying to meet. Now, while the players are on the ice, is it for the player or for you to feel your coaching? Because I know and I still get excited. I still get excited. And I tell you, I can hear, I can hear other coaches talk and you can tell even at the high school level, usually which team is winning and where the momentum is. It's because whichever coach you can hear yelling the loudest and the fastest and the most, that team's usually ahead. And uh, I, I got a, you know, a good friend in, uh, in Wisconsin that I used to coach with. And every time his team was winning, boom, he'd start yapping and uh, everything's loud. But when his team was losing, dead silence. And uh, I also have another uh, opponent uh, uh, right now that's a, is a very similar characteristics. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, uh, you know, I get excited too when we're winning and I'm pretty quiet when we're losing. Um, but the kinds of things that I'm talking about, do you have to, you understand, can the players really hear you? Do you think they can really hear you? And can they think they can really react? Uh, and how are you balancing creativity and structure? And I'm going to ask you to listen to uh, a guy Gadowski, who is uh, a very respected uh, coach from Penn State, and see if he can't uh, just share a couple of things. Hey, Wes, we're not seeing anything. Is that good? I'm not seeing it yet. It's not looking like that video is popping up, Wes. Is that going for you, Jake? Jake? I am not seeing it. Okay. Can you listen? Are you hearing? Nope. Nope. I'm going to gas it then. Bottom line is, okay, bottom line is, I'll get back to, back to here, is... Uh, Guy Gadowski says uh, the best coaches uh, don't say anything on the bench uh, while the play is going on. Uh, they don't yell at uh, players when they're out there. And uh, um, the players can't hear. The players don't have time to react. And the whole idea is you want to allow players to make decisions. That's part of the creativity of the game. That's what's really cool about hockey. That's why we only have one time out in hockey instead of about 60 like basketball. They think they have to call timeout and coach all the time. And we just let players play. Our coaching is done ahead of time. And so uh, our yelling at players on the ice is, uh, is really detrimental, if anything. And uh, uh, we, we need to allow players to develop uh, on their own. Sorry about the uh, technical miss up there. Okay, let's keep going here. In-game strategies. Okay, so we're talking about now once the game gets going, like what are you going to do? How do you impact the game a little bit? Well, first of all, you establish your starting lineup and you think, well, I got to have the same kid every time. If you have the same lineup, starting lineup every time, uh, you know, you're missing out on, uh, on great team concepts. And, you know, I've, I've had youth coaches tell me that, you know, Jeepers, the coach starts his own kid every time, every time it's center. And he always starts him with the two best players. And uh, that kid ain't even the best player. Like, let's, let's not, uh, let's not uh, uh, you know, pretend. And so you got to vary that for sure. Um, do you need set lines and positions? One of the things that uh, I'm a big believer at, at the youth level is you don't need set lines. If you establish set line, I got a blue line, a green line, and a red line, then all of a sudden, as soon as you break that line up, you're going to have problems with parents. So you just let kids play. And then every game, you just establish, okay, who's going to play together today? Who's going to play together today? Obviously, as you get a little bit older, there does develop some chemistry within line mates but it's not uh, it's not going to happen at the peewee level that uh, that chemistry is a, an essential part of your team in December it might happen later on that you settle on some lines but uh, you don't need to make uh, waves to your uh, on your team uh, early on and then uh, uh, how do you get players off the ice the best thing to uh, uh, the best way to make your team have poor chemistry is to uh, let one player or two players stay on the ice forever. 
you have to practice changing on the fly. And uh, that's obviously it's done in practice, but you have to understand some key things here. If I take a real quick look at a rink right here, if our benches are here and here, uh, we can put players out on the ice, line up a group of 10 players here, a blue team and a white team. And uh, we try to we'll put a puck down here in the corner. These guys are going to break it out and we're going to try to put some pressure on them. And the other players are going to try to get off our defensemen, our defensemen. But we're going to hold on this side, try to keep them towards the boards. If this is my bench, I'm really happy with changing when the puck's over here. I'm not as happy with changing when the puck's over here because everybody likes to try that quick wide breakout and now the puck's back in the other end. So if you work with your team on, on changing fast and getting pucks into this part of the ice and changing here because as you change, players come out here. If they come out on this side of the ice, they're coming right into your traffic and they get the puck back in. And uh, so that's just one of the things that uh, you can do in order to kind of help encourage that. That's all about uh, team play and, uh, and getting kids to understand uh, uh, how to play fast and how to play together as uh, well as a team. Do you keep track of the length of shifts? Uh, you know, you know, early on, you might think, OK, I got to have a stopwatch and track it. Uh, try watching the clock. It works uh, pretty well also. But uh, uh, you have to be able to manage that in your in your mind. And you also have to manage how are you going to keep things fair and think ahead. You know, if there's a group uh, of players that you do want out on the ice uh, towards the end of the game, uh, how are you going to get those shifts short? You have to be thinking three and four and five shifts ahead of time. OK, I got this guy out here. I got this guy out here. How am I going to be able to uh, get him back out there at the right time when he's out there against players that uh, I want him out in that situation? So thinking ahead is really, uh, really critical for you. Now, also, uh, when you get to special teams, depending on the level, um, you know, what have you created? Uh, do you have set lines? Do you have set plays or do you have set concepts? Concepts is how I'm going to work a two-on-one, okay? How do I work a two-on-one? What's my play by my defenseman? Uh, do I always look to go D to D if the puck comes out on the strong, on the strong side or from the corner? And uh, am I looking to go D to D right away or do I have to go right back in? Uh, what are the concepts that I use? And uh, do I need set plays? Well, set plays are, are only that great unless until they uh, get broken up and then the kids have to react. And so using concepts like uh, uh, low support and high support and always figuring out where players are going to be is, is a good thing. When you're killing penalties, a uh, key question uh, here today uh, in the last couple of years is the concept of do I ice the puck or not ice the puck? To ice the puck or not to ice? And there's, again, is a balance between creativity and structure. And, uh, you know, if you're a Peewee and a Bantam team and you're, you're thinking about, man, oh, man, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, I want to help develop players. If you help develop players, then allow players to skate and go. And, uh, and if they turn it over, they turn it over. If you're more of a structured coach and you're really concerned about winning, then you're probably going to be like, you know what, just ice the puck anytime. It's 50-50. We'll win the draw again and we'll ice it again. And we'll just ice the puck continually. Well, I would certainly tell my forwards, anytime my forwards get the puck and they get their feet moving up ice, they don't ice the puck. They're always thinking offense. They think offense all the time. Okay. Difference if it's my defenseman down low, okay, and you got a chance to clear it, take a look. Okay, where's the opening going to be? The opening's probably going to be at the dot for you to clear it. All right, so clear it there. It's not going to be at the board because one of their other team's defenseman's over on the boards and probably in the middle of the ice. So look at for the dot to clear it. But the forwards, we want them to get up and go. So figure out the strategy that you want to use there and use that balance between creativity and structure. Just Those are just concepts for them to think about and you're hopefully uh, teaching them. Your in-game strategies overall, are they systems or are they concepts? Uh, have you taught angling as a part of your forechecking? Uh, have, you, uh, you know, have you taught stick on puck as a part of defense? And uh, have you talked about support both offensively and defensively? Those are things that you'll establish. Uh, Face-off plays. Face-off plays are only good in, uh, if your team wins the draw. If you're not very good on face-offs, they ain't very good because now all of a sudden it's, it's out the window. And uh, so you got to understand that. And then uh, if, if you're in a situation where you've got, you're allowed a timeout, 
uh, you got to decide what's what's the purpose for that timeout. Is it uh, to establish uh, to set up a play? Is it to rest guys, or is it to change the momentum? Okay, and I'm I've been more of a uh, of a second period timeout after I give up two quickies or three quickies uh, uh, here in the, the recent future or, or recent uh, past where I got to like uh, I got to stem stem the flow just a little bit, and uh, uh, so I'm going to be more of a right after two quick goals. Uh, right now, I got to change the momentum of the game, but uh, uh, I try not to, you know, everyone says, well, I got to hold that timeout to the end. Yep. Holding the timeout to the end is good. But what if I get a five on three um, power play with, uh, you know, 50 seconds left and my, my best players are out there and I'd like to go again with that. So once again, depending on the age, what I'm going to do. Um, managing the end of a game. If uh, opponents uh, have an extra attacker when we're up, when do we shoot at the empty net? Okay, under what circumstance you'll see the uh, strategy more and more uh, these days is uh, take a shot at the empty net. I'm uh, uh, not always been uh, such a believer in that unless I'm up by multiple goals. Uh, I'm a big believer in trying to keep the puck out of the middle area of the ice. Keep it out of this area of the ice. Just pop it to the outside, pop it to the outside. We'll get our chance to go step at a time, step at a time. And then once we're in this area, now we can attack the net. What I also don't want to have happen is my players who are below the goal line to fire the puck out in front of the net, trying to score a goal. Now I got a couple guys trapped and the other team comes down. Uh, that's just, uh, that's just me thinking, uh, uh, thinking aloud and thinking quick. Now, if we are, uh, when we are down, uh, my question is always, okay, when do I pull the goalie? I always ask, will we get another offensive zone face off? And I know a lot of times today, uh, you know, you see NHL teams that are, are more, more quick to uh, pull the goaltender earlier. And that's, that's great. I'm, I've always kind of been that, that philosophy. I've seen, uh, I've seen high school teams that uh, wait until the, the, the puck is under a minute to go and they wait till they get possession in the offensive zone. And now they, they don't get possession in the offensive zone. And so now all of a sudden the other team's got it cleared. But I'm, I'm looking at an offensive zone face off as my preference. Uh, even at the high school level, uh, a lot of times players don't manage the puck well enough going up, uh, going up the ice and getting the puck in. And uh, uh, my question is, will we get another offensive zone faceoff? If I'm behind, I might not be as good as the other team, and so therefore I might not get, I might not get another offensive zone faceoff inside two three minutes. Um, so those are just some of the things that I think about with the uh, with with uh, in-game strategies, things that I have to be prepared for. Uh, and then I get back to like, how am I on the bench? What's my, my body language like? What's your appearance? What's your dress? If you've, uh, if you've you know, ever been to a Woodbury High School game, you know that uh, uh, I'm a tie guy. I'm a shirt and tie guy every day and uh, for high school. And uh, you won't find me with a coffee on the bench. You'll find me with a bottle of water sitting down there if I need it. But uh, uh, you know, I, I, I oftentimes uh, don't like the culture where uh, a coach shows up uh, in uh, jeans that, uh, you know, that he, he used to change the, uh, the oil on the truck. And uh, he's got, uh, you know, a 24 ounce cup of coffee on the bench. Uh, you, you shouldn't need your coffee on the bench at, uh, uh, you know, to coach. It's just, it's just not necessary. And I think it gives a little unprofessional look. And uh, I want to have a, a professional appearance. Uh, your posture and your energy is really important. Kids feed off of that. They can see, you know, uh, I mean, I've had, I've had my wife tell me, Hey, you look over there, you and your assistant coach, you've got your arms crossed when you're behind and you got this frown on your face. You got to change that. People see that. And uh, I know I, that's, it's happened to me. Uh, your facial expression, your arm movements, your arm gestures, when you, you know, put your arms up and, uh, you know, try to call out the referee. That's a, you know, that's kind of a degrading concept. Uh, I think it's really important to understand. It's easy to coach when you're winning, uh, but you kind of get measured as to what kind of a coach you really are when you're losing. And uh, that's just to try to figure that part out. Communicating with referees. Uh, I, I go like this with, uh, it's kind of similar to my, when parents want to talk with me, I ask them, is it constructive or destructive? Are we trying to correct something and teach something or, uh, and show something, or is it destructive, meaning that I'm trying to put you down? What's my purpose? And if I'm coaching at the youth level, I have to understand what's the age and experience of the referee. 
I understand at the high school level, what's the, what's the uh, experience level of the, high, of the referee, their high school referees, you know, and, uh, and I have to understand that. I also have to understand how my team will react. I, I find it weird that every time that, every time I yell at my, at the referees, we lose. Like, why is that? Is it because we're losing and I yell at the referees or do we play worse after I yell at the referees because my kids use that as an excuse to play with not as much passion and they just kind of give up. And how will my player's parents react? Are they gonna throw a, you know, a 32 ounce Coke on the ice like uh, happened one time just because I was upset at the referees? Could, could be. Uh, you're, you're the one that sets the example as the coach. So uh, make sure you kind of understand that, okay? Um, I'm not going to try that, not going to try that one either. Okay. So as the game goes, as the game goes, uh, and you get after the game and, uh, whether you've won or lost, you have to understand that your tone with the players and your body language with the players is everything tone and body language. Okay. Do you have the appropriate balance between competitiveness and education? And is it necessary to speak to the entire team? And some coaches sometimes like, okay, nice job, guys. We'll talk about it at practice the next day. Or I'm sorry we didn't win, guys. Let's talk about our practice the next day. Just so that I don't say anything that I would uh, maybe regret saying to the kids. And then as kids are leaving, do I say something positive to each individual player before they leave? And I try to do that. I'm not great at that, okay? I'm not great at that. I'd like to be better at that. Uh, but do I say something positive to each individual player before they leave? And then how do you manage your assistant coaches? Because some of them might have a short fuse. Uh, you got to be prepared for that. How do you manage parents? Okay, what's your strategy for managing parents who are coming to pick up the bag for their kid or beating them outside the locker room? Uh, and, and then what's your approach to referees? Do you thank the referees? I always thank referees before the game. I always thank them again after the game, regardless of the outcome. You, you just thank them. Okay. Uh, sometimes I'll give them, that was a great game, but I always thank them. And then the locker room, uh, you're responsible for the locker room, not somebody else. You're responsible. And everything in here has to be balanced. Okay. Are you balanced between uh, a, a competitive coach and an educator? and understand that that changes all the way up. I think that was what I had for you. Jake, you got any questions there? How'd I do for time? 40 minutes, not bad, a little technical snafu in there, but we're okay. No, that was awesome information. And I think that uh, everything you talked about is spot on with what our coaches uh, really need to hear because we all think we do a good job on the bench. But until we start self-analyzing and self-evaluating ourselves based on some of the factors you talked about, I know there were a few areas where it clicked for me that I can do a better job um, on the bench as a coach from what you said. Yeah, so I did have a, a few questions okay. that came through. The first one, how do you get youth parent coaches who coach their own child to not have a personal agenda when coaching their own kid? Great question. And uh, here's, here's, uh, here's what you do. First of all, um, first of all, as a, uh, uh, an association, you have to try to get away from at the higher levels, get away from parent coaches if possible, uh, and utilize them as assistant coaches. Uh, I know in Woodbury, our association is doing a really good job of that. And, uh, um, but at other levels, it's just not possible. So I, I spoke with one coach this past year and he said, Hey, tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have my, uh, um, I'm going to have, uh, my one parent who's got, uh, uh who's got a, a player at, uh, who plays defense. I'm gonna have him coach the defenseman and another one who's coaching the forwards. I'm gonna have him coach the forwards. And I said, I said, that's exactly the opposite of what you should do. I said, uh, you should have the one who's got the defenseman coach the forwards so that they can actually coach. And then the one who's got the defense, the forward to coach the defenseman so they can actually coach because otherwise all they're going to do is just coach, 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 instruct their own kid. And you're, there's going to be a real sense of favoritism towards that kid. And, uh, and when, he, and he was a, a first year head coach at this particular level. And, uh, 
And he said, man, that was the best thing that I did. The other coaches bought into it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what you need to do. So the structure within your staff is the biggest start to it. And your head coach has to, uh, uh, has to understand some of the balance things that we talked about here ahead of time. So that's, that's a start, I think. Yeah, and that's a great start. Um, another question was, if you do talk to players on the ice during game play, what types of things do you say? Uh, I think uh, my favorite one word phrase to them uh, came from uh, uh, Kevin Constantine uh, when I was coaching a youth clinic with him. Kevin at the time was a uh, uh, head coach of the, uh, he had just been released as the head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. And uh, he, was, he had about four stents as an NHL coach. And uh, the only thing he said on the bench to the kids was look. And he said it and you know, projected that out there. Look, look, every time you get the puck, look. And if the kids are just reminded to look, now they have to make the decision. And so I've tried to, I've tried to uh, you know, take that concept to heart and say, yeah, is there one simple thing that I should have kids do? Look, look. Uh, so I think that's important. I think the other thing that's important is change, get off the ice. You know, that's like at some point, especially with younger players, they don't necessarily understand that they can get off the ice. The first time that I coached my daughter in uh, U10 hockey, they, she didn't know that you could get off the ice when there wasn't a whistle. How long was that? Okay. Like U10 girls, you may never have a whistle. Okay. And we're on the bench screaming, get off the ice. I can't, there's not a whistle. Yeah, you can. Got to teach them that. Like, uh, it's like that Mighty duck scene when the teacher is running the bench and she just whistles and all the players do a quick change. Yep. Perfect. Um, with uh, a one-goal deficit, with a one-goal deficit, when do you pull your goalie? Two-goal deficit, when do you pull your goalie? Offense is own face-off would be great, okay? And I'm going to be a little bit earlier, I, you know, I, Anytime, anytime inside three minutes, I'm fair game. You know, anytime inside three minutes, uh, that's good for me. Uh, if it goes four minutes, you know, to outside of three minutes, boy, I don't know, with a two goal, two goal lead. Um, I just look at offensive zone face off. When am I going to get another chance? Am I going to get another one? If I'm putting a ton of pressure on them, then I might not do it uh, uh, as early, but uh, I, I want to, I want to give my kids a chance. And if, if I passed up an offensive zone face off under two and a half minutes to go, and we never get another offensive zone face off, then I think I did a bad job managing the end of the game. Great answer. Um, another question is what do you see as the biggest coaching difference between Peewees and Bantams? This in particular coach is moving up this year and, and is interested in your thoughts. I think the, uh, the biggest difference is uh, understanding um, the role that body contact plays and, and uh, that a lot of the kids at the, the Bantam level are really going to be afraid of body contact and the game takes on a little bit of a different element. It becomes a little bit more of a young man's game and uh, uh, with the physical part of the play and you need to be able to teach that and you cannot assume that the kids know that. And uh, that has to be a, a, a really a forefront uh, of, of what you're, what kind of aspect uh, you're going to be teaching them. I think from a uh, from another perspective that uh, you have there is um, every level that you go, go up, uh, people tend to take the game more seriously. And at the bantam level, uh, they're you know a step away from high school, and we know how important that is here in the state of uh, in the state of hockey. Uh, is the goal to, to play at, at the high school level and potentially beyond. Um, but the Bantam level, things begin to kind of shake themselves out. And so you have to understand there might be uh, more pressure from parents at the Bantam level than there was at the PV level. Absolutely. And I think that on what you just said about uh, players may not know something, so you can't harp on them about it. I think you're referencing body contact or checking. Um, but I think that's a big piece. We oftentimes want to try to get irritated or even try to overly correct, overcorrect something during a game that we've never worked on at practice. And we have to know uh, that, that if we try to coach something that's never been talked about, 
players might just roll their eyes at us and go, well, coach, we've never learned this yet. So I think that knowing what you've taught and how you've taught it and just reinforcing that in practices is, is, a, is a great piece of advice. Yeah. So um, it looks like the only other question, Wes, is wondering if you can share this PowerPoint. So if you'd be willing to just email it to me and we'll get yeah. that posted on the Minnesota Hockey website. Yeah, and let me uh, just uh, offer out to uh, those of you who are uh, hockey directors uh, uh, or other uh, board members at uh, your associations. One of the things that uh, that I do on behalf of Minnesota Hockey is I do get out to uh, uh, put on associate, association level clinics uh, and se little seminars like this. So if uh, uh, if it gets to the to the fall or you know late summer or something like that, you want to want me to address a, a level of coaches. Uh, uh, as to uh, maybe some coaching behaviors and habits that you'd uh, like to see instilled at your association. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, you can just uh, set up a schedule with uh, Mike Toiliger uh, at uh, Minnesota Hockey, and he'll, he kind of manages our, uh, our team's schedule. And uh, I'm not the only one that can go out and speak to those things, but uh, um, you know, I, I do that a little bit. So uh, but, you know, be happy to do that with uh, any association. Awesome. So. Awesome. Thank you very much, Wes. Um, for those of you that have questions after this presentation, you can reach out to Wes directly, or you can contact myself or your local hockey director. And to, and to find information on your local district hockey director, go to minnesotahockey.org, roll over about, board of directors, then committees, and you can scroll to the hockey director committee which has all of your district's hockey director information and the hockey operations committee tab also has Wes's information. Uh, you can contact him. Thank you all for joining us. And we have some more upcoming player development webinars that will be announced and released in the next day or so uh, on some really nice topics that I think you'll all be interested in. So thank you all for joining and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you, Wes. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Nice to see you. some familiar names as well. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here.